Is an American type sports organization possible in European football? Why the European Football Super League didn't succeed in a suggested format? And the most important question for us, what negotiation principle wasn't respected that ultimately led to the failure of this project? If you're eager to find out the answers to these questions, stay until the end of this video. Hello, I'm Jarko and welcome to Cobblestone Negotiations, the channel where we discuss negotiations in a simple language. Club football in Europe is organized through national leagues, ranging from top professional all the way down to the amateur level. Besides these national leagues, two other main competitions are national and European cups. In the national cups, club, clubs play uh, within a country and uh, they face each other across all, all quality levels. While the best qualified uh, clubs within each country play uh, European cups. The number of uh, clubs that uh, qualify for European cups depends on the quality of the, the league itself. The five strongest leagues, which are um, English, uh, Spanish, Italian, German and French, give the most clubs while all other, all, all other leagues, depending on their coefficient, give less. The highest level of European competition is the Champions League, while the lower quality clubs play Europa League and the Conference League. The most important trait across all national and European competition is meritocracy. And why is this important? We will see by the end of this video. And the highest authority in European football the one that uh, supervises everyone is UEFA, which stands for the Union of European Football Associations. And here we come to European Super League, when, which when it was presented in April last year in 2021, was supposed to be a rival to UEFA's Champions League. But obviously something went wrong. Before we dive into those reasons, let me first introduce you the European Super League itself. It was intended to consist of uh, 20 clubs, of which uh, 15 would be uh, permanent governing clubs, while only uh, the remaining 5 clubs would uh, earn their ticket through national leagues. The founding clubs uh, were Real Madrid, Barcelona, Atletico Madrid, uh, Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, Tottenham, Juventus, Milan and Inter. And uh, these are 12 clubs. And the re remaining uh, three spots were saved for the Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund, and uh, Paris Saint-Germain. But uh, these uh, last three clubs refused. These 20 clubs would be divided in uh, two groups of 10, where they would play with each other. And uh, the best uh, four clubs uh, in each group would uh, progress further to two-legged uh, quarter and uh, semi-finals and uh, the winner of the European Super League would be decided in uh, one final match. The money for the project would be provided by an American investment bank, JP Morgan Chase, which uh, pledged around uh, $5 billion toward its formation. The lion's share of this money would uh, go to the founding, already the richest clubs in the world, and uh, these 15 clubs would divide between themselves around 3.5 billion euros. In terms of timing, at least two reasons led to the announcement of the European Super League in the moment when it was announced. The first reason is that uh, the biggest clubs in Europe were hit very hard financially with the pandemic, as uh, their uh, business model demand, demands a, a lot of cash, which they receive through the, mainly through broadcasting rights and uh, partially through stadium tickets revenue. And uh, both these uh, cash streams were seriously affected in uh, lockdown. And the second reason why the announcement came so suddenly one uh, Sunday evening uh, last April was that uh, for the next day was uh, scheduled the announcement from UEFA regarding um, some changes in European Cups that would uh, benefit also the biggest clubs. But obviously the biggest clubs wanted uh, the whole pie for themselves. And their goal was partially achieved, as the whole football community was uh, caught by surprise. The UEFA president was very angry as uh, he felt betrayed by his uh, fellow football club presidents. In this moment, uh, Super League founders probably thought that by getting UEFA off guard, they hit the jackpot. But 
Little did they know that UEFA wasn't the real decision maker. Now it's obvious that the football club presidents didn't respect our second negotiation principle, which is know the real decision makers. But what is even more strange is that it seems they forgot who are the main players in this game, which are football players and their coaches, which were never consulted. But most importantly, they for forgot who the real decision makers are, the ones for whom this game is played. And uh, they are football fans, obviously. It seems that in all conspiracy and uh, secrecy to go around UEFA, the presidents of the most powerful football clubs just forgot who really pulls the strings here. If they paid attention to our second principle and uh, they knew the real decision makers, they would probably design their negotiation strategy differently. And we believe this will happen in the near future. This way, although they for sure believed that uh, the timing was excellent and uh, maybe it would be if the real decision maker was UEFA, but as we now know that uh, the real decision makers uh, were fans, the timing just uh, couldn't be worse. In the middle of a pandemic, when everyone is suffering on a personal or at least a financial level, it is perceived that already wealthy people and uh, their clubs are fighting to earn even more. So I'm asking you how this could end up differently. The first to complain were English fans, and within two days, all of the six English clubs withdrew from the project. Even some of the representatives of these uh, six clubs apologized to their fans. Soon, other clubs followed. Milan, Inter and Atletico Madrid withdrew from the project as well. And only Real Madrid, Barcelona and Juventus stayed faithful to the project. It was even romantic to see how football fans fought for the football as we know it. For the right for all clubs, no matter how big or small, to have an equal at least in the limits of their financial power, but still somehow equal chance of participating in European Cups. It seems that these 12 founding clubs just forgot that the main building block of European football is meritocracy. Real Madrid president Florentino Perez wanted even to convince the audience that it was beneficial for everyone if the richest clubs receive even more money. I think uh, his reasoning was that if uh, the richest clubs uh, become richer, they could pay even uh, higher signing fees uh, to smaller clubs. It is uh, like uh, the small clubs are there just to provide uh, players for them. And uh, I don't need uh, to explain you how this was received with uh, football fans. How important this issue was and how the topic uh, hot was you can see even uh, from the reaction of the prime ministers of many European countries. Even EU Parliament uh, had uh, something to say as uh, they said that uh, this project goes against uh, European values, against uh, fairness and uh, sport merits. Even UEFA's shady history full of scandals could help the project architects to deliver this project. The reason is the whole negotiation strategy was wrong from the start. They negotiated with the, the wrong party, in this case with UEFA, which is just the middleman between the game and the fans. Obviously, the whole project was developed so that the richest clubs can go around the middleman and earn more money. Let me give you just one more fact. The winner of the Champions League, if he wins every game in the entire campaign, can earn maximum around 80 million. For example, last year's winner Chelsea, which uh, didn't uh, win every game, earned around uh, 70 million pounds. And uh, the founding clubs in the Super League, just to enter into this league, would get around uh, 250 million. So the motivation is obvious. Will it happen sometimes in the future? Maybe. Maybe even probably. But especially now when they know the, who are the real decision makers. And lastly, to respond to my first question regarding a possibility of an American type sport organization in European football. I will make a remark here. In Europe, if your club uh, lose, the fans expect that players at least look sad. 
even better if they look destroyed. While very often we can see in the US that after a game, no matter who wins or loses, players just uh, joyfully chat with each other. It seems uh, fans in the US uh, see sport differently compared to an average European football fan. And this is important because when this whole thing about European Super League exploded, English fans of the clubs that are owned by American owners believe that uh, their owners uh, care only about the profit and not the game, the passion of the game itself. It is probably true that the American owners of the clubs like uh, Manchester United or Liverpool pay closer attention to the bottom line compared to, for example, Chelsea's or Manchester City's owner, which are Russian and uh, Middle East uh, oligarchs. But uh, this uh, doesn't need to be bad. To obtain a profit, uh, the owners uh, need to negotiate with the real decision makers and, in this case, to listen to their fans. If you like this video, please like it and uh, subscribe to the channel. And I will finish this video with uh, Pep Guardiola's thought about this issue. It is not a sport if it doesn't matter if you lose. Thank you for watching.